great to know that we can experience miracles. Let me tell you, my day has been filled with miracles. It's been filled with miracles today. For starters, I got lost in the way to your church. <laughs> and then your, your, one of the pastors called me and he says, I'm coming in a white pickup truck. Well, I follow the wrong white pickup truck. <laughs> And then say, why are you following me? I said, well, you're taking me to the church. So, well, I can get you to any church you want, but I'm not your guy. <laughs> <laughs> but seriously, uh, what a miracle. My name is Rabbi Yitzhak Shapira. And you know what I all think is for a Jewish person? All the way from a small religious community from Israel to be with you here in Lubbock? Can you find the art of that a little odd? <laughs> it's very, very strange. I didn't even know there was a such a place as Lubbock. <laughs> and I want to talk to you for a second about miracles today. You look at me, I'm a miracle myself. You see, my, my family, uh, I have an older brother and a sister, and my parents wanted very much to have children after my brother and sister. And my father served in the uh, 1973 war. Some of you might be old enough to remember this particular war. It's called the Yom Kippur War. And in this particular war, my father lost his earring and he lost much of his mobility. So they told them, my parents that they are not going to have children. I was born in the very first day of the seventh month. That's pretty early. A Jewish boy needs to be circumcised when he hit the eighth day. I wasn't circumcised the eighth day. It took 60 days for me to get to this point that I, I can be out of the incubator. I was uh, born in a, into a very, very large family. As a matter of fact, they gave me the name Yitzhak. Yitzhak is the name of Isaac. That is the name of my grandfather. He has 14 grandchildren, and I am the littlest of the 14. So they decide to name me after, after him. And it's funny. I felt in many ways I'm like little Joseph, telling on all our other grandchildren in the family. <laughs> I was the youngest one, and the hero for me has been my grandfather. It's a big, big family. My, those of you do not know, I, I'm a first generation born Israeli, but the generation before me, most of them were not born in Israel. They were born in the diaspora. My family is a Sephardic family. It's a huge family that came from Iraq. Now, those of you do not know that, Iraq was a center of the Jewish community. That is giving us, for instance, the Jewish code of law known as the Talmud that was written in Iraq. And my family decided one day in the 1940s, and they were very, very wealthy, to leave everything behind and to come to this special land called the land of milk and honey. So they got on four donkeys and they put everything that they can on those donkeys. And they started their journey into the promised land. And this is how I got, I got to be born in Israel. This family is so big, our family. How many of you have watched the family, the, the movie, Fat, Big, Fat Greek Wedding? <laughs> they need to make a movie, the, the big, fat Jewish, Jewish, Jewish family. You know, my family is just like this. Hardly dysfunctional when we can fight about everything, but we love each other. <laughs> and a matter of fact, one of the stories I, I, I remember growing up is, you know, in Passover, everybody know what Passover is, right? In Passover, we have this booklet, it's called the Haggadah. And there is a story in the Haggadah about four children. One of them is an innocent child. One of them is a child that doesn't know how to ask. One of them is the wise, wise child, and down of them is the wicked child. Now, how, how many of you think anybody would want to be the wicked child in the story? 
Nobody wants to be the wicked child in the story. And the way it's work in traditional Judaism, you sit in a very long table and you read in turn. And the grandfather, my, uh, my Orthodox grandfather, uh, he's the one that dictates the order. So we try to always calculate in advance. Where should we sit so we will not be the wicked one? <laughs> and all of those grandchildren, you know, all my cousins and uncle, live within one mile with each other. It's like the tribe. We are the tribe. The tribe of Levi, you know? We all live with each other in the same building. Uh, there is not such a thing as personal space. And a matter of fact, I remember I, I, I was raised up in such a secluded Jewish neighborhood that I never met a Gentile until I was 17 years old. I didn't even know what is a Gentile. Gentile sounds like a, a rhyme for reptile. You know, I didn't even know what it meant. <laughs> what do you mean? Not everybody Jewish? I didn't know that. And I remember another wonderful festival. How many of you have heard of uh, the story of, of Esther, the, the book of Esther? And there is a, a Jewish holiday called Purim. And in Purim, you put a mask on, mask or costume or something like that. And I had the greatest desire this year to be the knight of the round table. <laughs> My poor mother search of all the tailors, tailors in town. And she said, sorry, son, there is nobody that can make you a custom. You know, I wanted one that they have the rounded face, you know, like they're, they're all blocked and they have the shield around them. And I wanted the shield and the sword. But she says, son, sorry. But then my mother, being such a good mother, show up at school. It's always good news when mothers show up at school, right? <laughs> and she says, son, I found in the corner of the city a tailor that made you a suit of a knight. I left everything, and I remember myself, six or seven years old, running, 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 sweat dripping. I can't get it. Wait, poor him is tomorrow. I'm going to be in the night, and I'm running. I'm running. I'm getting there. And he showed me the armor and this suit. And then he said, I have a special surprise for you. And guess what he handed me? A shield. There was a little problem with the shield, though. Guess what was, what was on the shield? A big, juicy, red cross. I have seen this cross. And I received, let me tell you, the biggest panic attack of my life. I remember starting to cry and cry and cry and weep and running from this. I never want to be a knight again. I never want to be a knight again. I knew nothing about anything that related to the cross. I just know that it's something really bad. It is something really evil and wicked, and it's something foreign to us. That was my first exposure to Christianity. <laughs> Matter of fact, I remember growing up. How many of you remember growing up, honestly? You remember growing up? I remember growing up, you know, growing up in Israel is a little bit different than growing up in America with Judaism. Especially in our observant Jewish setting. I remember going with my grandfather to the synagogue every Shabbat. And you have to understand, all the, the elderly sitters, they daven, and they, they are very quick. And I'm just davening. I have no idea what they're saying, but I daven, I daven. Amen. And I love the part, the amens. And I had difficulties keeping up. Very difficult. But my grandfather made sure where every Shabbat at the shul, well, when a Jewish boy hit 13, he get what? A bar mitzvah. Really, I don't remember much until the bar mitzvah, until this time. And then when my bar mitzvah came, not only that I received, you know, you have to chant your Torah portion. Not only that I had to chant it because it was a new moon, they gave me a double portion. A double portion. Not I have to do one, I have to do two. And I remember my grandfather looked like this. Mm -hmm. Is he going to mess up or is he going to get it perfect? 
And during this time of this bar mitzvah, I remember my portion. I can sing it to you today. That's the way it starts. It's the love of David that have to Jonathan. And boy, I fell in love on the spot with David. I said, this is my kind of guy. He mess up all the time. <laughs> I can relate to this dude. Later on, I understand that David is really a picture of the Messiah in many ways. But during this time, I didn't know that. I wasn't looking for any messiahs. I knew the Bible very well. I was in religious education. But nobody ever mentioned to me a messiah. As a matter of fact, my big day comes that I go to the Torah. And you know, there's a Jewish blessing when you go to the Torah. It's called a, a shield of Abraham. You sing, King, Helper, blessed be the shield of Abraham. I didn't realize how true this blessing will come to me. You see, they start stoning me with those candies. And all what I remember, I'm holding the Torah, and it is my shield. I'm singing the shield of Abraham, and I'm just protecting people. And everybody say, more candies, more candies. Aim at him. He hit him with the candies. I can't remember much about this day either. See, my memory is fading. Oh, what I remember, some candies hit me right between the eyes <laughs> and knocking me down. A matter of fact, I got to tell you what I did this last time I went to Israel. I had such a lovely experience. I went to Israel, and it's a little Orthodox synagogue. I decided that I'm going to do something a little brave. I'm going to go back and relieve my childhood. How many of you ever done that? Go back and relieve your childhood. And I just said, I'm going to go back to the synagogue. And guess what? I got to the synagogue about three months ago. And it looked exactly the same. <laughs> Nothing has changed about the synagogue. How many of you want to see the little synagogue? Do you want to see it? I'll play you a little clip to show you what happened right before I walked into the synagogue. You have the clip ready for us? You do? Okay, while they're getting it ready, let me say this. Oh, you know, they got it ready. Excellent. And you got five. Synagogue. You notice there are two floors, one for men and one for women. A complex six or seven synagogue. So I'm walking cautiously in there. I'm a little frightened. I can't go inside because it's a prayer. Uh, you notice people are praying. And I stop there. You can stop the video. Now you say, that doesn't look like much, this synagogue. Let me explain to you. You see this complex? So you understand that it's not only that the, the, the churches compete among themselves. Synagogue competes sometimes among themselves. There are five synagogues in one block. The Iraqis have the Syrian synagogue, the Moroccan have the synagogue, the Yemenite have the synagogue, the Ashkenazic have the synagogue, and each one, when you walk in Sabbath, whoever can shout the loudest for the Lord, win the most people for this Shabbat. <laughs> well, as I come there, you can stop the video. You see this man who's standing there? He's the bodyguard, and he's a lot bigger than me. He wear this giant David star, this big. And he sees me and he says, who are you? I says, I'm just a guest. What are you doing here? I'm just coming to pray. Okay, come in. You sit here and don't move a muscle. So I said, okay, I'm just going to sit here and not move a muscle. This is the synagogue I go in. But you know, in 30 years, something's going to change. Well, guess what? I come there, and in my luck, guess what they have in this Shabbat? A bar mitzvah. I am relieving my bar mitzvah again. And the little poor soul is dealing with the same issue I dealt with 30 years ago. The little boy looks shell-shocked, and they draw the candy. But this time I say, yeah, give me more candy. <sighs> Let me hit him. <laughs> now I know what it feels like. The same guy that was uh, uh, scares me before, the big guy with the David stuff, come to me again. But this time he comes and he kisses me. 
He said, oh, brother. Mwah, 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 mwah. And I said, what happened? He says, you come with me. He take me in front of the Torah. And he said, you sit here. Don't move. Okay. Can I sit here? No. You sit here in this seat. Don't move. Wait till the rabbi to come. Okay. The rabbi came. And he kisses me. And he hugging me. And I ask him the question. What is going on here? He said, do you know why I put you in this particular seat? I said, I have no clue, frankly. <laughs> he says, I want you to lift up this seat. Lift it up and look upside down. You know, it's like a, a seat, like a school seat. I said, okay. I turn it upside down, and here is what's written in the bottom of this. It's written, this seat was purchased for life by Isaac Shapiro. That's my grandfather for eternity. <laughs> it says, do you see this Torah in front of you? Do you know how do we have this Torah? It's your grandfather. He gave it to, to us. You are welcome here because those who came before you. Why am I telling you this story? Because I want to tell you something that I am thankful for my grandparents and my father and mother. I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for the Jewish people who commanded, were commanded to tell the stories from father to son to father to son. And for that I owe them. I owe them so much. I know it is hard to imagine because, but, but if it wasn't for them, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't be here. We did not grow up in a secular home. Here in America, some would grow up with, you know, with synagogues and cheeseburgers in one hand. That wasn't us. We were not allowed to drive in the Sabbath. We had to walk to the synagogue. We were not allowed to do anything in the Shabbat that is, that is prohibition of the Shabbat. And we were raised this way. And frankly, it didn't bother me at all. Later in my life, here I am a teenager, still Jewish, still observant, still Jewish today, by the way, yes. <laughs> uh, we moved to America to some circumstances of, of our life that I cannot get into now. But when I came to this country, your great country, I didn't know your language. Okay, I didn't know English so good. And you know how it's the best way to learn English? American TV. Hallelujah. American TV is the greatest thing. Not. <laughs> not. And you know, that is, uh, I was 17, you know. Still, this is my first time to meet a Gentile. Hear about Christians. And I turn on TV. And boy, I didn't even sleep in the first year so good. And there was this guy on the TV that I really kind of related to. His name was Robert. Robert Tilton. Anybody heard about Robert Tilton? You don't never heard about Robert Tilton before? He's, uh, he was, uh, you know, he had the scam, the big scam thing. And all what I knew, he clothed as he's nice, and he started saying, in the name of Jesus, like that, and miracles would happen. And I start to imitate him. It was my entertainment. That's how I learned American TV. You know, he closes that over and a miracle would happen. And then he said, I want your $50. <laughs> and boy, oh boy, that was a great way for me to learn your language and culture. Great American TV. Another exp that traumatic experience that I have, except to Mr. Robert, that I thank him very much for teaching me my basic English, uh, was going to the grocery. You know, in Israel, by the way, you know Texas, be proud. I didn't know that, but Texas, did you know Texas, the Texans called the beef people? I didn't know that. And I came to the first time to the, to the supermarket, and there was something called white meat. Now, white meat in Hebrew is chicken. 
So I'm going to the first time to my go to the grocery, and my mother says to me, "Please, honey, go get some white meat." I touch the cover, not the pork itself, the cover of the pork, and I give it to my mother, and she said, "Honey, I don't think I meant this white meat." <laughs> I said, ah, I threw it in the air. I ran out of this. It was a wind dixie I'm still scarred until this day. <laughs> Please don't invite me to go grocery with you. Oh, it was so troubling. Oh, excuse me. I have to. Well. You must wonder at this point in the story. I, I have to give you my, a little bit about myself so you understand where I came from. You cannot be any more Jewish than the way I was raised up. You probably wonder how a, a, a good Jewish boy come to faith in Yeshua, the Jewish Messiah. And I want to stress the word, the Jewish Messiah, because this is not the Messiah of the Jews. He's not your Messiah either. How is it even possible? Let me state very clearly that the same God who my father serves, okay, is alive today. And he's doing miracles today. And I'm a story of a miracle. I came all the way to Lubbock, not to make you laugh, although it's fun to laugh but I came to Lubbock today because I believe in the message of who is the Jewish Messiah and what he came to do it is a message of life it is a message of hope it is a message of mercy we sing every Shabbat in the synagogue me kamocha ba'elim Adonai who is like you among the gods there is none other he is the only true living God. And a matter of fact, the first time I start to really thinking about my personal spiritual condition is when I open the Bible to Psalm 8. When God says, what is man that you are so mindful of him? But then he, he, he used the term for man is the term ben enosh. Ben enosh in Hebrew means a man who is in a dying bed. A man who is a dying and the scripture says that God is so caring for this man who is dying on his dying bed. The Hebrew term Ben Atam means son of dirt. I start to realize that we are really giving ourselves way too much credit as people. We are dealt without the one who breathed life into us. Do you realize that? We are. God, because of his promise to his people, you know, I started to read the Bible. Really read the Bible. I knew the Bible. I knew the Bible very good. But I started to read the Bible not as a historical book, but this book that is breathed into by the living one of Israel. And I came to a very troubling uh, portion in one of the Haftorah from the prophets. It says this. The days are coming. It's from Jeremiah. He said, the days are coming, declares the Lord. When I will make you a new covenant with the people of the Israel and with the people of Judea. It will, be like the, it will not be like the covenant that I made with their ancestors. What, when I took them by the end to lead them out of Egypt. Because they broke my covenant. True, I was a husband to them. Declared the Lord. This is the covenant that I will make with the people of Israel after this time, declares the Lord. I will put the law in their mind and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will they teach their neighbor or say to one another, Know the Lord because they will all know me. I start to ask a question wait a second, God, you have given us the Torah. And here you're saying in Jeremiah that you're going to give us another Torah. It doesn't make sense. And I start to realize that the problem was never with God Torah. God Torah law is perfect. 
The problem is with us. I start asking myself a troubling question. How many times have I broken the big ten? How many times, you know, in Judaism, we don't have the big ten. We have the big 613. Okay, you guys, you know, love your neighbor and yourself. Love the Lord your God. You have two. What are you laughing about? <laughs> we have 613. I said, oh my, I broke 613 in the last 15 minutes. I am in trouble. Well, you think I, I, I fell on my knees and said, oh, Yeshua, come into my life. <laughs> Not even close. One day, the holiest day on the Jewish calendars, called the Day of Atonement or Yom Kippur, I went to hear on on this day there's a special prayer called Kol Nidre where you renounce everything bad all your vows that you made in the last year I went to the conservative synagogue and I got there and guess what I missed the prayer time of Kol Nidre I was so upset I said I have never I'm 18 years old I have never in 18 years you know I have never missed the Kol Nidre I was very upset I'm fasting, and, and the Kol Nidre is a very important prayer. I said, God, what am I going to do? As I'm driving down the road, I'm seeing this huge sign. says, Bet Yeshua, the house of Yeshua. The house of Jesus. So, and I said, there's a David starter. Cool. I found another synagogue. I can hear the Kol Nidre. So I walk into this place. And horror hit my face from what I have seen in Yom Kippur. I see people in Yom Kippur washing windows. I call it washing windows. They are lifting their hand and they do this. <laughs> oh, oh, praise you. What on earth are you guys doing? This is Yom Kippur. Ah, the washing windows. Ah, what on earth? This is weird. This is not Jewish. Sorry. And then to make things worse, they say, Yeshua, Yeshua, Yeshua. And I'm thinking to myself, what I say, Yeshua, this is the name Joshua in Hebrew. That's Joshua. Why are they praising Joshua? Joshua wasn't even a prophet. He was a military leader. And I'm thinking, Joshua. So I start saying to myself, Yeshua, Yeshua, what are you doing? Oh, yo, yo. I didn't know there's something Jews who believe in. in, in, in. Then the rabbi came. He was in a talit, so I assume he's Jewish. I said, do you know who Yeshua is? I said, yeah, sure I do. It's this dude. That Moses trained. Why are you praising him? He says, no, 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 we're not talking about him. We're talking about Yehosh Yeshua. I said, oh, you mean Yeshu. You see, we don't call him Yeshua. We call him Yeshu. Yeshu, we drop the last letter. Yeshu means, may his name be blotted up forever. That's what we call him in Israel. We change his name because we don't want to say his name. And I said, don't tell me about this Yeshu. And I start screaming in the synagogue. I have a riot there. It was a big riot. I was kind of proud of myself at that time. <laughs> you call yourself a Jew? How dare you call yourself a Jew? And to make one matter worse, we're sitting in Yom Kippur. And you know, you fast in Yom Kippur. At the end of it, he said, would you like to have something to drink? I said, excuse me? What kind of Jew are you? You're really frightening me. This is Yom Kippur, and you won't give me some water to drink? You are really michigan -y. Cuckoo. <laughs> you guys are weird. First you do this. I start connecting him to Robert Tilton. I was expecting him to tell me now, you know. I didn't know what it is. He says, here, let me give you something. He go and give me a Tanakh. You know, my mother always teach me when you give you gift, you never said no. It's a Jewish thing. It's insulting. 
If you're Jewish and somebody give you something, you take. If they hit you, you run. <laughs> <laughs> so he gave me a book, in Hebrew. Now, fuck, I still have it up to this day. Here it is. It, it says, Torah, Nevim, Ketuvim, the Hebrew Bible, Ve'abrit HaChadasha, the New Testament. Whoa, what is that? He says, I want you to just take it and read it. So, of course, I'm, I'm at this point, I'm terrified. I, I know, I think I'm not going to come out, out, out alive from this Yom Kippur. This is my last Yom Kippur. I'm involved in some sort of weird stuff, washing windows thing. <laughs> anyway, so I take it. Now, do you think I will read it? <laughs> I'm not going to read this. This is not ours. But I was sensitive to it because it's a Hebrew writing. I cannot burn something that has Hebrew writing on it. And at this point, I took it and I put it with, next to the under, uh, dirty socks and dirty underwear and left it for two years. Never opened it, collecting dust. You know the old joke, man plans and God laughs. Have you ever heard this expression? I um, opened it accidentally one day, like that, just, you know, just like, let me see, just for fun. Where do you think I opened it to? Acts 15. Never heard about this guy named James and Peter. Who are those fellows anyway? They're not Jewish. But the one thing, that, act, treat, act, that was really weird to me in the story. I read one few verses just to pick. Scary, just to pick it. It's just something weird. All those people who believe in that man, by the way, I would never say his name. I called him that man. Never says his name. It's scary to say his name. We're Jewish. And they said, what are we going to do with all those Gentiles? Because they're all Jews. Strike you a little bit as odd that today, 2,000 years later, we say, how can a Jewish person believe that? 2,000 years ago, we say, how can Gentiles believe in that? You realize how far have we went? But of course, I read it, closed it, said, uh-oh, that's not for us. I, my life was going very well. I already had my bachelor degree and master degree by the age of 20, and I was pursuing my PhD. My life was planned up, and I was ready to go back to Israel and serve in a special, uh, special uh, uh, unit because of the training that I received in, in, in America. So my life was on the track. And then something happened that was not expected. I planned too much in advance. I met a beautiful, really beautiful, take my word for it, a very beautiful young girl that ended up being my wife to be. But you don't know that. And this girl really, had, I had an issue with her. She had a keychain. She was in one of my classes. And her keychain said, I love Israel. And at this point in my life, I really didn't want anything to do with the beef people or with the white meat people or anything that is... <laughs> I was really, even in America, I want no connection with anybody that is Christian. No, no, don't tell me. I don't want to know anything about this. I was very, very... And she said, I love it. So I, I, I said, she's kind of cute. So I'm going to try my pickup line. See how it's worked. <laughs> you know what was my pickup line? I'm kind of embarrassed to tell you that. Okay, but just keep it between us. Okay. I said, I bet you don't even know where Israel is on the map. <laughs> that was my pickup line too. <laughs> and you know what? The biggest joke, she bought it. <laughs> She said, not only I know where Israel is, I'm about to make Aliyah and move to Israel. I'm going to work there as in a ministry. What is a ministry, I said. Those kind of words do not sound good to Jewish ears. What is a ministry? 
<laughs> oh, it's when we tell the Jewish people about the Jewish Messiah. Ha! You want to tell me about my Hebrew Bible? Who are you to tell me about my Hebrew Bible? I memorize most of the Psalms. You're going to tell me about... Well, we believe that the Messiah has already came, and he was Jewish, and his name is Yeshua. Yeshua, we are Messianic. Oh, you are one of those Messianics. You are messy, messy, messy. <laughs> messy people. You are the people who turns Shabbat to Sunday and Tuesday to Thursday and Christmas to Hanukkah and blah, 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 Hanukkah to Christmas. Oh, yeah, you are messy. You are confused. Don't tell me about this. She was so cute, though. <laughs> I got to admit. Yeah. Like, that's going to work on me. I know my Bible. Now, she moved to Israel. There was nothing going on between us, so you understand. She moved to Israel. But because of what she told me about Yeshua, rage, when I mean rage, I mean rage, has grew in me to the point that I hate it. I hate it with a big capital H. Anybody who is associated with Jesus. I really hated them with a passion. As a matter of fact, I hated them so much that I decided that I will join an anti-missionary organization. Isn't it interesting? The same people who persecute me today is the people that I was part of them 15 years ago? Man plans and God laugh. During this time, I start to write and study in a yeshiva and through other things to find out for sure, not to find out, to refute, not to find out, to refute that Jesus is not the Jewish Messiah. I start writing articles and articles. When I start calling this girl, my wife to be in Israel, I say, you need to stop it. You are stealing Jewish souls. Stop it. Jews are Jews, and they do not need a Messiah. You are lying. They do not need blood. You are lying. Lie, 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 lie. Matter of fact, one time the lady picked up the phone, the Israeli believer, she said, hmm, you are worse than Apostle Paul. And I said, excuse me? I knew something about the New Testament at this point. I read it back and, back and forward to refute it. I knew how to refute it through Jewish eyes. I said, I didn't murder anybody. You calling me a murderer? I said, oh, yes. You murdered the believers with your words. You murdered the, the believers with your literature that you produce. You murder, murder, murder them. And for what? I click. Hang up on her. I will not listen to this. And I decided that I must get Jewish answers. I must get Jewish answers to the Messiah. So when this girl come back, I will tell her exactly what Isaiah 53 says. I will tell her exactly what Isaiah 7 said, what Zechariah 9 says. I will have every single answer. And these answers will come from the rabbis because whatever the rabbi says is equal to what God says. This is the environment I was raised in. I start actually looking for the truth. And one Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, I was really bothered by something I read in Leviticus 16. I read these words in the Torah, in the heart of the portion that we read in the synagogue in the Day of Atonement. In the 20th verse, he says this, when Aaron finished making the atonement for the most holy place, the tent of meeting and the halter, he shall bring forth a live goat. He, he is to lay both hands on the hands of the live goat and confess over it all the wickedness and rebellions of the Israelites for their sins and put, the goat, and put them on the goat's head. You shall send the goat away into the wilderness, into the care of somebody appointed to the task. And I realized this was the very first day of atonement that the Jewish people ever celebrated. 
And I start to say, wait a second, if this is what Torah means, and we do not have the temple today, and we don't make sacrifices, how can we really receive atonement? I know I broke the big 10. I know I broke the big 613. Oh, I am in trouble. And then I also remember as being as a little boy, seeing this young, strange tradition, an old ancient tradition called Kaparot, right there in the eve of Day of Atonement, where they take a chicken over your head and they slaughter it. And here's the word of the prayer. This is my atonement. This is my garment. May this chicken will go to death. And I will enter into life. I start asking myself, oh my, how can I observe properly Yom Kippur? I can't do it. And then I got to this chapter in Isaiah that really bothered me. In the 53, 53rd chapter, when Isaiah said that he was despised and rejected by mankind. A man of suffering, familiar with pain. Like the one from the people who people hide their faces. He was despised and held in low esteem. Surely he took our pains. And he bore our suffering. Yet we consider him punished by God. Stricken by him. And afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgression. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds we were healed. We all like sheep have went astray. Each one of us turned in our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the inequity of us all. I read this and I start asking the rabbis, who is he talking about? Please tell me it's not talking about a man. Don't worry, young man. It doesn't talk about the man. It's talking about Israel who will suffer for the sins of the earth, of, the, of everybody. I say, how can he talk about Israel? How can Israel atone for the sins of Israel? And then I found out that between the first century to the ninth century, Every Jewish rabbi believed that this passage does not speak of Israel, but speak of the Messiah. In my study at the yeshiva, I found this passage from the Jewish code of law called the Talmud. I read these words and I wept. I said, what have I done? Rabbi Joshua, the son of Levi, met Elijah. Standing in the entrance of Rabbi Simon ben Yochai tomb, he asked him, When will the Messiah come? Go and ask him yourself, was his reply. Where, will be he, where, will he, where, where is he sitting? At the entrance. And by what sign may I recognize him? The Messiah is sitting among the poor lepers. All of them unite. He will unite them all at once. And he will rebandage them all together. Where he unites them and rebandage each one of them separately. Thinking, should I want it? I must not be delayed. And I realize that from Jewish sources, from the basic pure Judaism, that the Messiah had to come to make an atonement for Israel. But do you think that would be enough for me? Of course not. I'm Jewish. I'm proud. I have the heritage of my fathers. I don't need a Messiah. But something in me started to crack that I must miss something about the complete truth. So with this, after I read this passage in the Talmud, I was in Jerusalem and I walk into the yeshiva. That's a seminary. And I showed them this passage in Isaiah 53 in the Talmud and I asked him, Who? You know who? You know, you know who? I wouldn't say his name. I'm scared to say his name. And he say, you know, I ask, is it really saying in the Jewish writing that the Messiah will come to die 
for the sins of Israel? Does it really say in the Jewish writing that you will come to make an atonement for Israel? And they say, oh, yeah, of course it does. So I say, how can we reject him? Doesn't it say that he must come before the second, the second temple destruction? Yeah, he does. How can we reject him? What have we done? I start shaking. Something about my foundation started to shake. I still live among the Jews. But I start saying, how can I, just a simple Jewish man, you can see something that the sages, the rabbis, have missed. Then I got to this passage in Micah when I read this, but you, Bethlehem Ephrata, to you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler, Melech, Melech Israel whose origins are from the ancient of time, from the day of old, from ancient times. It doesn't say that the Messiah will be born in Ukraine and will die in New York City. He said that the Messiah has been here around. He has been around and is now going to return. I said, God, who is this Messiah? Show me. And then I read this in Isaiah 7 when he said, Therefore the Lord will say, will give you a supernatural sign. The young woman will be with a child and will give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. God is with us. What does it mean? God is with us. It means, I am starting to understand that the Messiah, he and Hashem are one in the same. It's a one manifestation of the other. At this point in my life, this young person, my wife today, came back. And of course, she saw me all shaking up. She said, okay. So what do you think now about this guy, about this issue? Say, I'm not convinced. He's, he's not that impressive. <laughs> so okay, if you're not scared, ask him to reveal yourself, to reveal himself to you. I said, I'm not scared. I'm Israeli. We're not scared of anything. I stood like that on a concrete, cold, cold day in January. And I say, Jesus, uh, Yeshua, of course in Hebrew, Yeshua, im atakayam, taret atzmecha. I even spoke to him in Hebrew. You know, Yeshua can speak Hebrew, praise God. <laughs> Yeshua, if you are real, reveal yourself. That's it. Skeptic little prayer. Proud little prayer. What's happened the next moment was shocking. I fell on the concrete and I was paralyzed in 30 degrees for about 45 minutes. Was I able to move at all? I was paralyzed on this icy concrete as something came from heaven and just touched my heart. And you gave me a sign when I didn't deserve the sign. But do you think it was enough for me? <laughs> you know me better now. <laughs> Nothing is enough for me. That's why that if I can come to faith, anybody can come to faith. Then I continued to read. I say, he's not the Messiah. This con After seeing this miracle, it wasn't enough. But I did believe him. I believe that he was some sort of a Messiah. But I think he's kind of like the Messiah of the Gentiles, not of the Jews kind of thing, you know. He's just a good guy. He's not a bad guy, but the Christians are bad still. <laughs> and I started to have a Torah meetings in my house before having synagogue, inviting every Jewish person, every Jewish person that I could meet to come to my house. And it was wonderful. We come to talk about Yeshua, not as the Messiah, as a good teacher. And boy, it was a lovely time. You know how Jews like to argue sometimes? It was such a lovely, sitting on Sabbath till 1 a.m. in the morning yelling at each other. Gosh, I miss those days. And then one day, this Christian guy came there again. You 
Christians. He show up and say, you know, Tohi, why don't you read Psalm 2? Fine, I'll read Psalm 2. You don't tell me anything new. So I turn to Psalm 2 and says, I will restore my king on the Zion, my holy hill. I proclaim the decree of the Lord. He said to me, you are my son. Today I become my, your father. He asked me, so Tohi, who is he talking about here? Let me go see what the rabbi said. He's talking about Messiah. Thank you very much. So the Messiah have a son? I mean, God have a son? <gasps> Uh-oh. There's a little problem here. Ask of me, and I will make the nation your inheritance, the end of earth your possession. Not only that he have a son, the entire inheritance of the entire universe will be given to him. Let me ask you a question. Isn't God a jealous God? Since when God gave his inheritance to somebody? And then he said, serve the Lord with fear, fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son. Nashku bar pen in af in Hebrew. Kiss the son, let it be angry, and you will be destroyed in your way. For the rat can flare up in a moment. Bless our own, take refuge in him. And I knew one thing that Deuteronomy 4.35 says, you are not to take any other God except to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But here the Torah tell us to kiss the son. And God says, I put my king on the holy mountains. But also it says that there's no other king on the holy mountain except to God himself. I said, oh God, what have I done? I'm a mess. Not only now that I, 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 I accepted this Messiah, I'm telling them this is just human flesh. I am a wreck. I'm leading people astray from the Messiah. He is not just a human. He is the living one of Israel who reduces himself to a form of a man in order to reveal his goodness. Notice here it says in the, in the Hebrew, so that you will not lose the way. Yeshua says, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. In Hebrew, way, truth, and life, to you in English, doesn't make sense, maybe. But what it says in Hebrew, I am the emet and derech the, the chaim. That's mean. It's an acronym for the word, the one. He say, I am the one. Word one in Hebrew is the same word for the word love in Hebrew. I say, I am the Lord of love. I am the one you've been expecting. I'm not a flesh, human flesh. I am the manifestation of the one, the, the, the living one of Israel. Then I went to Proverbs and I read this. How about a man named Etiel? He said, I'm the most ignorant of men. I do not have man understanding. I have not learned wisdom, nor I have knowledge of the only one of Israel. Let me ask you a few questions, although I'm a simple guy. Who has gone up to heaven and come down? Who has gathered up the winds in the hollow of the ends? The answer for those is clear. It's the Lord. Who has wrapped the waters in his clock? And who has established the end of the earth? What is his name? And what is his name of his son? If you don't know that, go to the beginning and read again. Until you get his name of his son, Yeshua. Then I was also troubled to find out that God says in Zechariah 9, 9 that the Messiah will come lowly riding upon a donkey. But it says later on that he will come highly from the clouds of heaven. I said, oh my, not only that he came once, he's coming again. I am in a real mess with my theology. I'm going to have to rethink it. So one day I stood up in front of all those Jewish people who loved us because, you know, we talked about Jesus, but we never said that he is the, the, the divine Jewish Messiah. I stood up in front of them and I told them the truth, that he is not just a human flesh, but he is the Jewish Messiah that was promised to us through Abraham, through Isaac, through Jacob, through Moses. Through Isaiah, Jeremiah, and all the prophets. And in everything in Judaism, I saw Yeshua. In every prayer from the prayer book, I saw Yeshua. I want to tell you this. 
This has cost me everything I thought during this day. I went to my mother, I remember, and I told her that Yeshua was the Jewish Messiah. Yes. The next day they had a funeral for me. A funeral service when they ripped the clothes. Here's the son of Israel turned away with the Christians. And I tell you today, I am not a Christian. I am the follower of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, just like my father and his father. And I'm thankful that you make a way for me, for Messiah, through Messiah Yeshua. I want to tell you something. This is hard for me to say because I'm emotional about this. During this time, there was Gentiles, Christians, who loved me when I was such a mess. I was so unlovable. I was creepy. What you call in English? Creepy. <laughs> creepy person. My wife became, in essence, my wife-to-be. She saw a vision of me when she met me first. The first, first time. Leading many Jewish people to the Jewish Messiah. She shared this vision with me after it's only six or seven years of being married. It was incredible. It wasn't for her love toward me. I wouldn't be here. And I want to tell you something. I am willing today, and I make this announcement before all of you, I'm willing to be blotted out myself that one Jew will come up into the kingdom because the one who loved me and his name was not Yeshu his name not was may his name be blotted out forever his name was Yeshua the Lord save and I pray for this day that we will not say We will not say anymore in Mach Shmo May his name be blotted out. But all of Israel will say, Yeshua, King of Israel. Yeshua, Melech Israel. I will stand, I'm standing here in front of you today in behalf of many people. Of Rabbi Liechtenstein, the chief rabbi of Hungary in the 1900s that was 70 years old and he saw the Jewish Messiah and he was casted out by his own people here is what he said I am a honored rabbi for over 14 years am now in my old age treated by my friend as a possessed one by evil spirit by my enemy as an outcast I am become a butt of mockers who people that the finger that put the, the, the finger at me. But while I live, I will stand in the watchman. True, I may stand there all alone. I will listen to the words of God and look for the time when he will return to Zion in mercy. And Israel shall fill the world in his joyous cry, Hosanna, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who come in the name of the Lord. Hosanna to the highest. I stand today in his memory. I stand today in the memory of Rabbi Ephraim, the chief rabbi of Tiberias, who gave everything for Yeshua, where his children and his family were taken from him forever for his faith in Yeshua. I'm standing here today In behalf of a simple Holocaust survivor, my mother, may her memory be blessed. My memory be blessed. Who came a week before her passing away to know Yeshua. Here is what she had to say. I call it a Passover, a simple Holocaust survivor. And I told her, Mom, what about your atonement? What will you say to God? 
She was very sick with cancer. She called me the next morning. She says, the same woman who did funeral for me 15 years earlier. And she said, I saw him. I said, Mom, who did you see? Come on, don't play joke. I saw Yeshua. He's real. And I accepted him in the dream. And you don't have to be worried about me. The next morning, I receive a phone call from a small community in Canton, Texas, where I was invited to give a eulogy for all the men and women who were lost in the Holocaust. And I thought to myself, I've never been in the Holocaust. What am I going to say? And ask my mother to write this letter. With your permission, i like to read to you her words. She so wrote, my name is Esther Friedman Shapira. I was born in Vilna, and I'm the last survivor of my whole family from the Holocaust. I have two children in Israel, and one son in Texas. That's me. <laughs> I also have three grandchildren. In the name of Moshe Friedman, in the mem memory of Mother Zipporah Friedman, in the memory of my sister Rivka, and my two brothers, Halterke and Reuven, we will never forget them who were taken away from my parents and never saw them again. I will never forget how my father was crying and screaming at nighttime. I will never forget. My mother was handicapped. The Nazis were broken in her arms and never put it in a cast. They tried experimental shots on air. And because of that, she got a nerve disorder and therefore was always shaking. One, before, one month before that, she died and had a panic attack from all the memories of the Nazi. There is nothing that we should remember and never forget. After what my family and I went through, I still believe that the world can become a better and safer place for each one of us. It doesn't matter what color you are, what form of what religious religion you carry. Let's make sure that it will never happen again. Let's remember my father Moshe Friedman, my mother, my mother Tsipora Friedman, my bro brother Altric and Riven, and the six million innocent Jews who murder for nothing. May the God of Israel bless you. May God bless the Jews in the diaspora. May God bless the world. God bless Israel. God bless America in the name of Yeshua. My mother finally came to peace and reconciled and forgave because the Lord of love, Yeshua, Yeshua did this. And I stood there and I read this prayer and did the Kaddish. And as I said the Kaddish, I received a phone call five minutes after that. As they told me, just my mother went to be with the Lord, just as I was praying. What a good God I serve. That even in debt, he brought mercy and closure to my family. I was invited to Israel. And I'm all just done. Give me two minutes and I'm done. I was invited to Israel to give the eulogy. I have an observant Jewish brother and an atheist sister. Guess who they, they, they say to give the, will give the, the eulogy? The messianic. <laughs> he is the middle ground who broke the partition of hate. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> well, it's not so funny really because... I decided I'm going to do something different. I will stand up and tell them where my mother is and why she's there. So in front of several hundreds of our closest Jewish family, I decided to read this to them. This summarizes who is Yeshua? If I speak in tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have a grief of prophecy 
and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge. And if I have a faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to the hardship I may boast, but I have no love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. It doesn't envy. It doesn't boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoice with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. I read this in Hebrew. And one of my uncle came and asked me, he said, where were you, where were you reading from? I said, some, some poet, some really impressive poet. He said, what is the poet's name? Oh, we call him Saul of Tarsus. <laughs> that was almost my funeral with my mother this day. <laughs> Beloved, I just want to close and say this. And maybe less than Darcy, you can, you can join me. The Lord of mercy is the one who brought me to the Jewish Messiah. He is the Jewish Messiah. There is none other. I owe me my life. As we pray every Yom Kippur this prayer. I want you to think about this. This is my heart to my Jewish people. Faithful shepherd. Indeed, you are my son, the son of the Holy Spirit, the son of the Shekhinah, the great and mighty angel. Kiss the son. Rise up, all of you, and kiss him. Welcome him as king and lord. He is the master of the universe. There is no other name in heavens except to the name of Yeshua. Let me close with the uh, prayer. Do you have the book for Don Olam? Would you stand with me this morning, this evening? It feels like morning. It says, Lord of the world, who reigned before any form was created, when creation came above by his will. Then as king was his name proclaimed to be, and after all has ceased to be, he alone, Yeshua, will reign in awesome power. And he was, and he is, and she, and he always be in splendor, and he is first, and there is no other to compare to him, to be his equal. Without beginning and without end, he, he, he has the strength and dominion. And he is my God, my living redeemer, and the rock of my pain in the time of trouble. And he is my banner and a refuge for me the portion of my cup in the day. I call upon him in his hand. I entrust my spirit. In the time I sleep or awake, and with my spirit, my body, the Lord is with me. I shall not fail. Will you bow down and join me in prayer? Lord, we just come to you today and we ask Abba that you open the eyes of Israel, 
open their eyes. Rabbi, I ask you, I say, Abba, blot me out so they can come in. Lord, we ask that this will be a season, not just here in Southcrest, but throughout the United States, throughout South America, throughout Europe, throughout Asia, the Jewish people return to you, and most importantly, in Israel, where people will see the one who they pierced. Will you just join me in this simple prayer called Adon Olam, the master of the universe? Lord of the world, who reigned before any form, who was created when creation came, who by his way. Pastor, will you join us up or in the stage? We're going to close. I felt like by the Lord that we should to close together, Jew and Gentile together with Hatikva, the hope. If you don't know today the Jewish Messiah, Yeshua, I want to tell you that there is hope. Call on him today, and he will surely, surely. We'll answer. Will you please stand with us for Hatikva, the hope as we turn to Jerusalem? This is is. Will I ask you something? Even if you lip sync it, God can hear it. Will you join us today in this world with all your heart, please?
you. Let's give Yeshua a hand. He is worthy. You know, it's going to be hard to tell someone what they missed tonight, isn't it? Thank you for being here. They are going to be out. Uh, there's a table somewhere. It's out this direction. Is it in the parlor? It's just right out in the front. He has some material there if you're interested in it. What you can do is get your name on their mailing list so that you can keep up with what God is doing. And I know you'll be interested in that. I want you to show them a little south crest hospitality before you go um, and those materials there that he has are a very good material you would enjoy reading some of it listening to some of it so take a look at it before you go and i know that that helps support um, their ministry i also want you to pray for les and darcy they're going to drive back to fort worth tonight and so we're going to pray they stay awake uh, i know they've got a long way to go let me close this in prayer and thank you and, and thank the group that put the tables together and put all the stuff together. They did a great job. Um, to all our Jewish friends, you'll always have a friend right here on the corner of Memphis and South Luke 289. I promise Amen. you. This will always be a place. We love you. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, thank you for your blessings in our heart tonight. We thank you for what you've shared with us and how we've been touched by your presence. We ask for safety for everyone traveling, especially Les and Darcy. We ask that you give them traveling grace and mercy. And we just thank you again for this special time. Lord, we do pray for the peace of Jerusalem. And we look forward to the day when we get to see you face to face. Until that time, help us to be faithful. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Thank you. You're dismissed. Hallelujah.